Good morning and welcome to the third lecture on ethics. So far we have discussed on two schools of consequentialism, ethical egoism and utilitarianism and also the deontology as part of the non-consequentialist school. We have also discussed the deontology of Kant and the deontology of Rose. Today we are going to discuss other non-consequentialist schools. We have at least two other important non-consequentialist schools and that is what we are going to discuss today. So let us begin with the first of these two schools we are going to discuss today. The Divine Command Theory. The Divine Command Theory simply states a right action is that which is commanded by God and the wrong action is just the opposite what God forbids you to do. In other words the right action is what is willed by God and the wrong action goes against God's will. Now this theory is not only used by theists but also by atheists. We have the famous quote from Dostoevsky's novel Brothers Karamazov If God does not exist, everything is possible. The idea behind this, if God is the author of what is permissible and what is not permissible and if he doesn't exist, there is no one else to tell us the distinction between what is permissible and not permissible. Therefore, everything becomes permissible. Now, this divine command theory is often critiqued by invoking what is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. Now, let me put this Euthyphro Dilemma in its context. Euthyphro is the name of one of the dialogues of Plato. Euthyphro is the main character in this dialogue. Now, when Socrates is having a conversation with his disciples, Euthyphro comes late and joins the conversation. And he gives the reason why he comes late. He says he had to take his father to the court of law for justice to be done. And he further explains, his father caught one of his slaves who was accused of doing something wrong. And until his father wanted to be sure whether the slave had done something wrong or right, he had lowered him in a deep well while he was waiting for the arbiter to come and settle the matter. Now while that accused slave was in the well, fate has it, his life ended. So now Euthyphro finds that is an injustice that is done to the slave. So he finds that act of his father unholy. So he wants to take his father to the court of law to be judged and eventually sentenced. Now when Socrates asked Euthyphro why did he take his father to the court of law, Euthyphro said, because his father has done an unholy act. Now Socrates begins to interrogate Euthyphro. He asks him what is a holy act as opposed to an unholy act. So Euthyphro tries to explain this in the following words. The holy act is that which is willed by the gods and the unholy act is that which is forbidden by gods. Then Socrates raises a counter question. Is an action holy because gods will it to be holy or do gods will an action to be holy because it is is holy already. Now it is this particular question of Socrates which is appropriated 
and in the context of the divine command theory is formulated like this. Is an action moral or morally right because God wills it or does God will it because it is the right action? Now there are two parts to this question. It's about the causal relation. If you take the first part, is an action morally right because God wills it? The cause of the action is God wills an action to be right. And the effect of it is, therefore, the action becomes right. So what makes an action right? God wills it to be right. So that is a cause that makes the action right. If you take the second part of the question, does God will it because it is a right action? That something is a right action is a cause for God to will it for us to do it. So here the cause is that an action is right in itself and the effect is therefore God wills that action for us to be followed. If you take the first part and you answer, well, an action is right because God wills it. In other words, God willing an action to be right is the cause which makes the action right as the effect. Then there is a problem. It is very arbitrary. God can will anything. His ability to will is unlimited. So if he wills murder to be right, then murdering someone becomes a right action, morally speaking. This has a serious problem. If you take the second part, an action is right in itself, therefore God wills it. Then the divine command theory becomes obsolete or even false. Because God's will has nothing to do, do with an action being right or wrong. It is independent of his will. Therefore, God has no place there whatsoever. So in both ways, this argument can be shown to be faulty. We also have the famous critique of Leibniz in terms of this arbitrariness argument. Because God's will can be very arbitrary. And if that becomes the hallmark of moral judgment, it has a serious problem. So the famous statement of Leibniz is, if arbitrary will takes place of reasonableness and if in accord with the definition of tyrants, justice consists in that which is pleasing to the most powerful. So people can abuse imposing their power on others by invoking God's will, which happens most of the time. Now the proponents of the divine command theory will give a response to that. They will say, well, God cannot will anything arbitrarily because God is all good. Because of the supreme goodness which he is, he can will only what is good. Now of course, those who critique this theory will come up with a counter response. They say there is a logical fallacy. The fallacy is the fallacy of begging the question. What does that mean? Now, how does an action become good? An action is good because it is commanded by God. And what are God's commandments? Because God is only capable of willing good, God's commandments are good. So, the good means commanded by God and therefore God's commandments are good means God's commandments are good commanded by God. So this is exactly a circular reasoning. That is why it is called the fallacy of begging the question. Now, with this we conclude the divine command theory and move to another non-consequential school which is philosophically much more sophisticated called the natural law theory. The major proponent of this is St. Thomas Aquinas. And this natural law theory, theory is something very important because this is still today the official position of the Catholic Church. 
Now the natural law theory merely states the right actions are those which are in accordance with the laws of nature. Now we shall shortly see what the laws of nature, what does it mean when we say laws of nature. This theory also comes up with the doctrine of double effect, which is very important doctrine. This doctrine of double effect helps us to settle disputes between duties, especially when there arises a conflict between moral duties. We'll see both what the laws of nature is and what the doctrine of double effect is now. What do we mean by laws of nature? Now this idea is taken up from Aristotle's teleological understanding of the universe. Nature has a rational structure. It is ordered in a rational manner. So every part of nature is teleologically oriented. What do we mean by teleological oriented? It is oriented towards its end goal, the purpose for which it exists. Now, nature reveals what its purpose is. Let us take the example of the mango seed. What is the purpose of the mango seed? The purpose of the mango seed is to grow into a mango tree. It cannot become an oak tree. So that is its very nature. Now if it is the very nature of the mango seed to become a mango tree, then the mango seed should become a mango tree. Then it aims at its end goal, its purpose. Now in the context of human nature, Aquinas would say, the human nature is naturally disposed to protect life, preserve human life. It is also inclined to avoid doing harm. It is also inclined to act in a reasonable way. It is also inclined to develop, nurture social relationships. Now, all these things constitute the good of human person. Why? Because that is the very nature of human person. If it is the very nature that constitutes the good of the human person. So we need to realize these goals. All that is part of our nature. Which means to protect life, to avoid doing harm, to develop social relationships and so on and so forth. Now, Aquinas would say, how do we know this is our nature? We know it because we have the gift of reason. God has endowed us with the gift of reason. So we can discover it in the light of our reason. Which means reason becomes central to morality. Therefore moral laws have to be objective and universal. As long as reason is involved in moral laws, it has to be objective and universal. Because at least Aquinas thinks reason has to be the same for everyone. We cannot have two different kinds of reasoning. There can be one right reason, one wrong reasoning. But if there is a right reasoning, it has to be the same for everyone. Now with this, let us move on to the doctrine of double effect. The doctrine of double effect tries to answer the question whether an action is morally permissible or not. Especially if the action produces two effects, two results. So it gives us four conditions. Now remember all these four conditions are to be met in order that a an action becomes morally permissible. Even if one of those conditions is not met, then the action cannot be permissible. The four conditions are all equally important. The first condition is the action is inherently good or at least neutral. Now when we say inherently good, in itself it is good. 
regardless of the consequence or the effect it produces. Or at least it should be neutral, if not good. It cannot be bad in itself. The second condition is, if there are two effects, the bad effect and the good effect, you cannot use the bad effect to produce the good effect. The bad effect can happen as a natural side effect of the good effect. So you are not making use of the bad effect to produce the good effect. The third condition is you must always have the intention to bring about the good effect. Your intention is not to produce the bad effect, though bad effect may happen, but that should never be your intention. Your intention is always to produce the good effect. And the last condition is the proportion between the good effect and the bad effect. The good effect must be proportionately at least as important as the bad effect, if not more important. So these are the four conditions. Now, these conditions will become clearer when we apply this theory to a particular case. Let us take this famous case which we have been discussing for all the different theories we have studied so far. The famous deadly terrorist. Now, in order to prevent the deadly terrorist murdering people further, you want to arrest him. And the only way you realize that you can do that is by arresting his innocent family and torturing them and even if necessary, start killing them one after another. Start killing his wife, then his children and, and you continue executing his children. Is this morally permissible? Is this right? Now, the, well, let us try and apply all these four conditions. What is the first condition? The act must be inherently good. In, good. That means it must be good in itself, or at least neutral. Now, what do you do? What is the action here? The action here is torturing or killing innocent family members of the terrorist. Is the action morally good in itself? Is it inherently good? Or is it at least neutral? The answer is evident. It is no. Killing innocent people is never inherently good. It is not even neutral. So in the very first condition itself, you come to realize this is not morally permissible. You cannot torture or kill the innocent family members of the sought-after deadly terrorist. But in order to understand this doctrine of double effect, let us continue with other three conditions as well. The second condition is the bad effect should not be used to produce the good effect. In this case, do you use the bad effect to produce the good effect? Yes, you do. The bad effect is taking the lives of the innocent family members. You are doing it to produce the good effect. The good effect is to save the lives of others who can be potentially murdered by the deadly terrorist. So you are making use of that bad effect to produce good effect. So in the second condition also, this particular action is morally not permissible. The third action, the intention must always to produce the good effect. That condition passes the test. Because what is the intention here? Is to save the lives of innocent people. You are looking for the deadly terrorist to be arrested so that you can save the lives of the innocent people. And that is the reason why you do it. You kill the innocent family members of the terrorist. Therefore, your intention is right here. Therefore, it passes the test. The third condition passes the test. The fourth condition, the good effect must be at least as important as the bad effect. It is about the proportion. Is it the good effect is as important as the bad effect? Obviously it is. It is in fact more important than the bad effect. The bad effect is only the lives of 
the few family members of the deadly terrorist. Whereas the good effect is lives that are saved. That could be thousands. While the first two conditions fail, the last two conditions pass the test. Yet, because the first two conditions fail, this action will be judged not permissible. Now let us evaluate the natural law theory. Now we have these three criteria by which we evaluate it. Is it consistent with the considered moral judgment? Is it consistent with the common moral experience? Is it useful in problem solving? As regards the first criterion, whether it is consistent with considered moral judgment, this particular theory fails. Why? Because killing a homicidal man to save innocent people, killing is inherently wrong. It's a bad action. In itself it is bad. Now, considered moral judgment would say, well, if you have to save innocent life, you may have to kill a homicidal, somebody who murders people without any qualms of conscience. So therefore, it does not fulfill the criterion of being consistent with considered moral judgment. It passes the test of the second criterion, namely, it is consistent with common moral experience. Oftentimes, we use this natural law theory in our everyday life choices. Particularly, we use the doctrine of double effect. But it falters on the third criterion. It is not useful in problem solving. Why is it? Now, Aquinas believed that human nature is very positive, optimistic. It has a tendency towards doing good. But we know from our experience, human nature has a tendency not only to do good, but also it has a tendency to do bad. We have inclination towards good as well as towards bad. So the human nature is not necessarily always something that seeks good, but it can also seek evil. So therefore it does not help us to solve the moral problems because according to the natural law theory it would say well you do what your human nature wants you to do but your human nature may want you to do something bad and such experiences are part of our lives added to these three criteria we have also other problems now this theory relies on the teleological character of nature it assumes that nature is rationally constructed and it moves towards its end goal. Now, this kind of teleological thinking is part of many philosophical thinkers, starting from Aristotle, and then Aquinas had it, and even Hegel had it. Even Marx had it in some way. Now, but then there is no logical argument to support this teleological character of nature. And there is no empirical evidence. In fact, science comes up with a contradictory view that nature is not all that rational. It is chaotic. We have the famous chaos theory. And there is no logical argument to support that nature is completely teleological. It has a purpose. It is purpose-oriented. It is moving towards a purpose. There is no way in which we can establish it firmly. The most serious problem is natural law theory does not make a distinction between the facts on the one hand, and values and norms on the other hand. It simply seems to assume we can derive norms from the fact that something is the case, therefore something ought to be the case. Let us say, for example, slavery is natural in the society, therefore slavery should be in the society. Now, you see the serious problem there. Where people are naturally abusive, therefore people should be abusive. So it doesn't make a distinction between fact and values or norms. What is factual need not be 
what should be normative. So this is a serious problem that the natural law theory has. However, we learn something quite important for life from the natural law theory. Whatever may we may say, at the heart of the natural law theory, we find the respect for human life. Because Aquinas at least believed it is part of the human nature that we protect human life, we preserve human life. It is inbuilt in our human nature. So respecting for human life is an ideal that Aquinas posits. Aquinas also gives enough emphasis on reason. How do we know something is part of the laws of nature? He doesn't say God reveals it to you. You discover it from your reason. So reason plays an important role, though he speaks from within a theistic context, from within the Christian background. He is not limiting his moral theory within the faith context. He makes it accessible to everyone, all humans across the board, by placing emphasis on reason. Thirdly, Aquinas also lays emphasis on intention. Intention plays an important role. If you remember, one of the conditions of the doctrine of double effect is precisely this. What is the intention of the action? Is the intention to bring about good or bring about bad? So it is not only you assess the action in itself, in isolation, but you need to ask the question, what is the right intention? What is the intention behind the action? Whether it is right intention or bad intention. So these are some of the important contributions Aquinas makes from this natural law theory for us to learn. So we have uh, understood the theory. So I will quickly go through all these slides for you from the laws of nature so that you can have a quick look at it. I hope it is pretty clear, the natural law theory, it is something that the church accepts even today and we have got a lot of good things to learn from that even though there are also some loopholes in the theory. We have also critically looked at the theory but nevertheless we cannot forget that we can also learn something from this theory. So with this I conclude this lecture. Thank you for your patient listening. Have a good day.